Can we do like a cool intro? Like, a... <laughs> yeah. You're doing it now. You're doing it now. Hey, everyone. We're just waiting for a couple more folks to join us. So just hang tight for a bit. And we will do our best to start promptly at noon. And I think we're starting promptly at noon. So just hang tight for a bit. Thank you. All right, we're, well, we are at the top of the hour, so I think it's it's a great time to go ahead and get started. So hello, everyone, sorry about that. Um, my name is Nola Wanta, I'm your friendly MC for our LMU Business Insights webinar series. I'm the Senior Director of Business Development and Strategy for the College of Business here at Loyola Marymount University. Um, our LMU Business Insights webinar series is aligned with our mission to advance knowledge and develop business leaders with moral courage and creative confidence to be a force for good in the business and global community. And I think today we will definitely shine our spotlight on creative confidence. Uh, but before we get started, I'd like to quickly just go over some general webinar guidelines. For those of you who've joined us before, this will look very familiar. So as usual, please do type in your questions in the Q&A window. We would love for this to be an interactive session. Um, our speakers are very excited to interact with you. These questions will be moderated after the presentation and in some cases likely during the presentation. So just keep them flowing and as things come to mind, please feel free to type your questions in the Q&A window. Um, also, feel free to use the chat window to post your insights or comments if you have any, and I'm hoping that you will, I'm sure you will. And just as a friendly reminder that this webinar is being recorded and will be available after the presentation. So without further ado, I'm very excited about this presentation today, and I'd like to welcome um, Professor Andrew Rome, who is our co-director of our M School, who will be introducing our speakers for today. Over to you, thank you. Professor Rome. Thank you, Nola. Um, thank you, Nancy Donovan, uh, and to our entire CBA team, including our Dean, Dale Smith, for putting this together. Uh, so today's theme is um, eSports, gaming and eSports, new, the new digital frontier. And what we're gonna do is take a really brief look at an exploding space. We're really fortunate to have uh, four guests from Damage. Damage is a full service agency whose mission is providing, uh, creating campaigns and content uh, that resonate within gamers and the gaming community. Um, as Nola mentioned, I'm Andy Rome. I'm a marketing professor within our CBA. And along with my colleague, Matt Steffel, I'm co-director of our M School program. And if you see Andrew's hat, he's wearing an M School hat. So Andrew, thank you for representing. Um, today, I'm really excited also to introduce our four guests. Um, they are. Uh, they lead the. They lead the um, both the creative and the strategy and the business side of Damage. Uh, our first is Andrew Dubois. Andrew is a advertising and branding veteran. Uh, he's worked at some of the major agencies in the world, and Andrew is director of account management at Damage. Um, also introducing Tyrone Wang. Tyrone is the chief marketing officer at Damage, um, and. He has been in a he's been a professional esports captain and player, and I guess Tyrone, one of the world's most successful team fortress or TF2 teams. So Tyrone, thank you for joining us today. Uh, thirdly, we have Brian Kim, Chief Operating Officer. Brian is a ad executive and a tech entrepreneur with over ten years of experience in corporate development in gaming and esports. And then fourth, we have John Runkle. John is the executive creative director at Damage, and he uses his wit, words, and wisdom to guide some of the world's biggest accounts um, as they navigate new media and the way consumers behave in the year 2021. So thank you to you four. Thanks for everyone for being here. And I'll turn it over to you, Andrew. Oh, thank you so much. What a warm welcome. Uh, it is always nice to feel so professionally accomplished and not just, you know, a normal guy that you know, teaches some classes at LMU and gets the opportunity to work with these knuckleheads all day long, every day. Um, so today we're going to talk about gaming and esports. We refer to it lovingly as the new digital or virtual frontier. There's tons happening. Um, we were actually just uh, talking about some of the virtual reality stuff happening, but there's tons happening from game devs to communities, to the audiences, to learning the business and branding of marketing to a new generation that's super fragmented, 
super optimistic in who they are, but basically decentralized. It's no longer like a broadcast game where you shoot out a Super Bowl commercial and everybody's on the same page. So um, although I wasn't pictured there, we've kind of got three folks here from the damage agency. Uh, Andrew was kind enough to intro them, but I would like each of them to give a little bit more context into kind of their discipline at the agency, what they do, and what we're going to plan to do today is basically walk you through kind of key components or pillars of what make up gaming marketing, esports marketing, and there's a big difference between the two uh, versus traditional marketing, as we all know. And then uh, we're going to dive a little bit into what has happened over, say, the last 15 to 20 years and where we see it going. This is entirely um, open forum for communication and questions. So Q&A throughout, please, if we say something you don't understand, holler at the Q&A. We'll make sure to pause and make sure that everybody's on, some, on the same page. We find ourselves kind of talking too quickly sometimes because people, we assume people are, are up to speed on this stuff. So please stop us. But let's get to intros real quick and then we'll dive into, we have a few slides, nothing to belabor, but uh, Tyrone, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself and we'll go to Brian, John, and we'll kick it off. Sure. Uh, nice to meet you guys. Uh, again, I'm Tyrone, uh, Chief Marketing Officer over here at Damage. Um, a little bit about me. So I'm a lifelong gamer with a background in marketing, uh, gaming hardware product sales. Um, and I guess what makes it interesting is that um, I was originally a pro gamer back in the day. You know, this is before the giant salaries were really going out. Um, I did get a chance to travel across the world, uh, notably to Europe. Uh, to compete for North America when I was competing actively back in like 2007 or so. Um, but yeah, a lot of through my learnings, um, through being a professional gamer, I landed in product hardware marketing. Um, I was a uh, the esports director for one of the leading system integrators or uh, gaming PC builders. And I got the chance to interact pretty much on the ground floor of esports, working with every team um, like TSM, C9, CLG, the likes, uh, a lot of the influencers, as well as um, having the honor of running my own tournament series uh, for that particular brand. So through there, um, you know, a lot of learnings and ultimately uh, started this agency with some of my best friends. And I, I guess with that said, um, I'll throw it over to you, Brian, if you want to do a quick intro of yourself as well. Yeah, thank you. Um, good to meet everyone. My name is Brian, co-founder, uh, chief operating officer here. Um, Basically, you know, my job is pretty simple. Just make sure uh, people get paid, computers work, um, things like that. Uh, but my background is, um, you know, Tyrone actually went to high school together. Uh, we actually met through video games. Um, you know, we were, um, you know, competing at a pretty high level when, you know, when we were barely getting paid, you know, a few bucks to, you know, win a random tournament. Um, but my background is uh, obviously video gaming. Um, I, I spent a little time in crypto. Um, and now I'm involved in technology. So my overall role today is to help, I guess, shape the agency to become a more tech-enabled shop, which we'll kind of get into, um, you know, throughout the rest of the presentation. But uh, thanks for having us, and good to meet everyone. Excited to be here. Uh, my name is John. I am uh, the executive creative director of Damage. Uh, I've been in advertising for about 20 years now. Uh, I've been in well, the gaming's at the beginning, so a lot of time uh, on Nintendo, helping to launch things like the GameCube and parts of the N64, and then uh, the uh, the Wii and the Switch. A lot of time working on 2K, from like, NBA 2K to to all the other sports that the 2K sports had, as as well as uh, some of the game launches. A lot of work with Microsoft, a lot of work with PlayStation, a lot of gaming stuff. So uh, in the course of those 20 years, I've you know, worked in the, like 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 a BBDO New York, Lieberman at Chicago. Uh, various shops out, out here in LA, uh, and uh, it's really just been kind of a an awesome pleasure to be uh, gaming and then also have that be your job at the same time. Um, so I consider that to be kind of a plus of the advertising world is you can find your passions and then you can help spread the, the sort of joy of those to other people. Uh, and so uh, I consider it uh, an honor and a burden to work with these gentlemen who uh, uh, know their stuff really well and um, and we um, we just have a blast uh, playing and gaming. So uh, fantastic thing, and we're happy to be here. Andrew, tell us something about yourself. Uh, Aquarius, uh, mid thirties. Stop! Stop! stop. <laughs> wrong! Wrong room! Wrong room! <laughs> Try something else. No, uh, as as you can see, we like to have a lot of fun, and we think that's our goal to being successful in the space. Like 
gaming is in of itself a fun activity. Um, and then when you take it to the competitive landscape of esports and the tournament that's around it, it becomes very serious, very quick. And we feel like we can balance the two. Um, so you'll often find us joking. I actually know the least of any panel, panel member up here. That's why they didn't put me on the flyers because they're like, this guy's not even worth calling out. Ty was an ex-player, Brian's done crypto and John's been in it for 20 years. I just made the, the transfer about a year ago. Um, so I'm actually very novice myself in learning it. Uh, and it's cool because it's evolving so quickly. I think that's what we wanted to talk to you all about today. So I think the first thing that we wanted to do is, is ha kind of have Tyrone talk about the difference between gaming and esports and qualify some of the misnomers that might be out there. And then we're going to get into the pillars and a timeline. And I think that'll be the, the right spot for everybody to weigh in with questions as we go through this. But know that we this is a rapidly evolving space. It's got a million different dimensions. The complexity is ever growing. Um, and I think that what we're trying to do is deduce it down into a simple to understand thing. And then at the end, we'll talk about kind of the roles that are starting to form in the landscape of working in gaming and esports and in the marketing side of things. So I'll turn it over to Ty to just touch on that. And we'll get right into it. Cool. So yeah, as the definition states, part of the gaming world where professional gamers compete in high stakes competition. So I guess some of the things like Esports, you know, has existed for quite some time. Um, esports and gaming are one and they're similar, but, you know, quite distinct in the fact that, you know, high stakes gaming, competition, broadcast viewership, um, all of those things tend to change um, kind of the landscape that esports lives in. Um, so, you know, a lot of people think gaming and esports are the same thing. Uh, they might not quite be right. You know, esports pros are all gamers but not all games are esports ready. So that's definitely one of the big distinctions that we wanted to make here today. Um, and I guess just talking about how rich esports is as a whole, like esports feels new, especially because uh, in recent light, you're hearing about all the giant tournaments happening or whatnot. But, you know, esports has existed for 20 plus years. Um, like Brian, or like I had mentioned with my history with Brian, you know, we had competed back in the day for Counter-Strike 1.6. Um, where we would play at different LAN tournaments. Obviously, the viewership is nowhere close to what it was um, at the time. It was really just our friends coming to watch. It wasn't even really broadcasted live just because that technology didn't exist at the time. But with that said, um, we can start jumping into it um, as we kind of break down different pillars or how damage sees uh, esports as a whole. Uh, if Andrew, if you'll jump to the next yeah, slide. Yeah, yeah, hey, we just got a question from Joe Tyrone. Oh. Um, and he asked, is it harder to get noticed by a team now compared to 20 years ago? Um, you know, it's hard to say. Definitely there are more people competing across the board. Um, however, nowadays there's a lot more infrastructure. Um, you know, there's amateur tournaments. Um, everything is now recorded. So in terms of visibility, you know, if you're competing uh, at the highest levels of amateur, uh, there definitely are ways uh, to get noticed better today than there was in the past. I think back in the day, um, there was a lot more emphasis um, in terms of like networking, getting yourself out there. But now that, you know, there are leaderboards almost for every league and whatnot, um, it's very easy for teams that are scouting, uh, cherry picking talent off of, um, you know, high level teams uh, that haven't quite broken into the pro scene. What I will yet. say is like getting noticed is a lot easier, but um, like everyone is so good at games nowadays because, you know, you, there's so many online resources. You can learn how to, there's tips and tricks on how to get better. And I think the, the biggest challenge for a lot of people who want to get noticed by pro teams is understanding the amount of sacrifice it takes to get yourself to that level, to even be on the leaderboards, to get noticed by the pros. And I think, um, a lot of the different platforms that are coming out right now, like play VS that introduced esports to like high school students, um, as they kind of create this, like path to pro almost like if I wanted to play baseball, I know exactly what I got to do, play little leagues, play in high school, you know, play D1 and my, the, the, my career path is kind of like laid off for me. That doesn't exist in gaming. So um, the, the skill level is something that I just wanted to comment on. Um, cool. No, uh, yeah, by the way, keep the questions flowing. Love uh, taking stops like that. And, you know, we definitely want to have a conversation with you guys more so than a presentation. So uh, keep the questions flowing. Um, with that said, uh, we'll move to the next section. So again, this is really how Damage kind of takes a look at um, the worldview of esports. Uh, these are all the different segments that we kind of operate in. And I guess we just wanted to give you a quick tidbit on each one. So, you know, I think it all starts with communities. Uh, really, again, when we had mentioned like esports has existed in some, one form or another for the last, you know, over 20 years, and that still rings true today. 
Uh, we see communities cropping up across Reddit. Uh, back in the day, it was all like on IRC and you had to jump through hoops to, you know, find like-minded folks. Uh, but nowadays, um, it's about, you know, finding it on Discord, uh, following your favorite favorite Twitch influencer. Uh, communities are being built all across the board, across so many different platforms. So it's really exciting yeah. to see. And, and one thing to just jump in here with, like a, a lot of folks, you know, reference Slack as a working platform where you can share information real time, give updates and manage workflow. Like Discord is a community that does a lot of the same functions. But for example, uh, if you don't know what Discord is, it, it's basically Slack for gaming. And they just turned down a $12 billion valuation from Microsoft, who tried to buy them earlier uh, this month. And it's really exciting to see because where we all work in like email every day, actually at Damage, we do a lot of our work. For example, we, we run the North American League for uh, Ubisoft's title, Rainbow Siege 6. Uh, or Rainbow Six Siege, sorry. And so we do a lot of our creative approvals for, for work and strategy on Discord. So it's really cool to see the difference in the evolution and how we're communicating, even on the business front, utilizing channels that are rooted in communities in the gaming world. Yeah, exactly. Well said, well said. And, and these are all kind of things that are, uh, think of them as table stakes, good things to know as we kind of, uh, you know, before we get to the next slide. Um, and just want to really put into perspective how, you know, these pillars of esports, how primitive they were when it started, like, you know, 10, 15 years ago and where it's come today, like, like talent, for example, um, you know, when live streaming became a thing, um, Tyrone was actually one of the first partnered streamers on Twitch. And at that time, around 13, 14, 20, uh, 13, 2014, um, people were really just streaming their gameplay. Like he's a really good pro and they just want to show off their skills. And it was a resource for, um, you know, people to understand how pro players play. And obviously as the ecosystem grows, the communities grow, you see a lot more special specialization, just straight up content creators, people that are out there doing, um, like makeup tutorials, people that are out there doing cosplay and 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 doing speed run. So um, the the definition of talent as we know it has evolved quite a bit. And obviously, people can now earn a living um, off of being a live streamer on Twitch. So I think where the the community has started and where it's going are night and day. Um, and this kind of really doubles down on the fact that this now requires. Um, you know, a thoughtful strategy from the marketer's perspective to speak to that community, to approach that community, um, have really well-defined and executed creative because it's no longer just a group of gamers like me and Tyrone, you know, in our hiding from my parents playing video games at three in the morning, right? People are making careers out of it, you know? So um, it's an actual audience that's, that's become, um, you know, something that's been coveted by a lot of marketers. Um, and, you know, competitions have always been a thing in gaming. I think there was, I'm sure there was like Pong tournaments, like, in the 80s and 90s or whatever but you know if we kind of start um the recent history of esports competitions it was largely played either in really shitty land centers where it smells like ramen noodles and, and stale cigarettes and hotel ballrooms to the barclay center where, where they're having these competitions so um i think as the evolution of gaming happens there's a lot more viewership. There's a lot more brands and sponsors that want to be a part of it. Organizations grow organically through that. There's now prize money, there's sponsorship dollars. Um, and now today, international esports players are getting the same travel visas as Olympic athletes and or professional athletes are getting in, in the United States. So um, in terms of salaries, endorsements, sponsorships, I think they're, they're pretty much professional athletes at this point. Um, and it's really been interesting to kind of watch this space grow from that perspective from, you know, Hey, I used to be that guy trying to earn 50 bucks playing a tournament. Now this guy made $6 million this year playing good video games. It's, it's kind of mind blowing, right? Um, yeah. Hey, Brian, on that, I was just yeah. reading that the Olympic uh, Association was actually going to have some tournaments coming up prior to the Olympics this year. So it is on the road to be in the Olympics. I would argue that it's not going to happen this year, although it's recognized by the committee. But in the, the next round, we should see it come up. And, and, and just to be clear, the, the, the sort of pain you hear in Brian and Ty's voice as they talk about this isn't at all the regret of the fact that when they were did it a few years ago, it was gift certificates and a handshake, and now it's millions of dollars. I they don't feel were, that way at all. I thought you weren't going to talk about that. I thought you were going to bring that up. But yes, yeah, so we were born like five years ago. start crying before. in the middle of all this, if you would just break down and, be, and just start dropping F-bombs about current players and how they don't understand. But you know what? I want you to enjoy you being you. That's what I want. Uh, yeah, it's, it's funny. Yeah. Like um, for me, I was playing professionally or professionally at the time. And 
obviously we had to think about our future and it's just so funny how it all kind of comes full circle uh the next slide you will see kind of how damage came to be but i think uh it's a really interesting uh i guess origin story of sorts or actually we can, we can jump back real fast just um uh as we kind of go through it we'll, we'll definitely take it in due time but with that said uh, jumping into the next category hardware uh, again i think hardware plays a super close uh it's it's close to my heart because that's kind of where i developed most of my professional career um so you know being a former hardware enthusiast and marketer um we play here in this space a lot you know being the former um agency of record for intel gaming uh, we got the privy to, you know, play with a lot of cool toys and see how, you know, hardware affects uh, the world at large for esports. You know, I think just even a couple of years ago, laptops couldn't really play video games, um, you know, on the go. But nowadays, you know, we're creating uh, rigs specifically for influencers so that they can, you know, take vacations and stream on the go. So it's something really interesting. And I think with uh, endemic hardware brands, you know, they were the first ones to kind of sponsor in gaming and esports and even if gaming and esports were to essentially drop off in popularity tomorrow they'll still be there and so you know we work very closely whether that's like collaborations with different uh um, AAA game titles uh creating new products um it's somewhere that we're always kind of focused on and keeping our eyes on the the ball there uh, let, me just, oh, let me just let me just jump in with a, another q a here um, so we got a note from Christine saying, my son is looking at esports uh, scholarships for college and wants to get a degree in marketing. Not many colleges have these opportunities and suggestions as to a path, any suggestions as to a path. He currently plays on an esports team in high school and also casts uh, his lower level team uh, and is mentoring as well. If you want to quickly touch on the yeah. uh, esports uh, component of it, I can actually say that um, so I teach in the uh, School of Business here in advertising and account management course, and you're absolutely right that the marketing component of gaming and esports is lost and there's no specific program out there just yet, but we will be trying to bring in some of this knowledge that you see in today's presentation into that class. Um, and, and I think that we'll soon see a lot more uh, gaming and esport focused curriculum pop up, but if you want to talk about the esports side of things. Sure. Um, no, that's a that's a great question. I think that's you know one of the big challenges that a lot of brands are tackling now. So um, I had the honor of uh, working with um, the hardware company at the time uh, back in 2014 with Robert Morris University. Uh, they launched the first scholarship varsity program for gaming and esports, uh, and I think we're seeing a ton of evolution with that. Um, in 2016, for example, UC Irvine announced their own varsity program, and they had a uh, they leaned heavily into education STEM components of gaming and esports. Um, they're still offering varsity uh, scholarships for you know top competitors uh, in whatever respective game. I believe it's like League of Legends as well as Rocket League. Um, but with that said, um, yeah, that's an active space that everybody's looking at right now to try to solve those problems and install the infrastructure as quickly as possible. Because you know we do strongly believe that. Um, committing to a, a gaming discipline uh, or a game is much like traditional sports and should lead the same benefits, um, a path to higher education. Uh, so yeah, it's, it's, it's definitely a, a hot topic within the gaming and esports world. And, you know, I think everybody is actively trying to provide solutions in this space. Um, and we've been a part of some uh, really compelling programs, uh, for example, with Intel to help uh, craft that vision for the future as well. Yeah, and I'll just say we got one more question from Garrett. We're actually going to be tackling that and some of our content in the slides that come. So just hang tight and uh, we'll get that one answered live for you as well. Cool. Back to you, Ty. Oh, cool. Okay, uh, we'll, we'll go through these next ones pretty quickly. So, you know, we're definitely seeing a ton of evolutions from both uh, the developers as well as the game titles. So developers are, it's pretty interesting just because, uh, you know, for example, in traditional sports, nobody actually owns the football or the game of basketball. It's these organizations that stand on top of these sports uh, that helps to you know, proliferate it uh, into the mainstream. But with developers, it's pretty unique because the actual sport is owned entirely by these different um, developers. So for example, uh, Valve with Counter-Strike Global Offensive, uh, Blizzard with their Overwatch, uh, Riot Games with League of Legends. And so it's created some really interesting dynamics within the space. 
Um, and, you know, a lot of the big companies even have their own philosophies when it comes to how they want to be handling esports. So, for example, Valve, which does uh, CSGO and Dota 2, uh, you know, some of the premier esports titles, they're very loose touch with their um, leagues. Uh, yes, they'll support the prize pool and help uh, create, you know, 30 million plus dollars in terms of the prize pool, but they do very little in terms of regulating the esports uh, and allowing a lot of these third-party tournament organizers to stand up their own leagues. Uh, but when it comes to, for example, uh, Blizzard Overwatch League, uh, it's really, you know, the Overwatch League and the Challenger League, and, and there's very little uh, third-party tournaments happening in the space. So, you know, they each have their own philosophies and how they're guiding esports. It's really interesting to see where they come up and where they fall short. So. Um, with that said, game titles, sorry, jumping to it real quick, Fortnite, um, Rainbow Six, like, I think when it comes to esports titles, they're really, uh, you know, a couple genres that really uh, has enough, that has been in the marketplace for long enough where most people recognize it. So, for example, Counter-Strike is a first-person shooter. First-person shooters is not a foreign concept for the most part. And so, you know, a lot of people tend to play these different types of games. Uh, same with, like, real-time strategies and whatnot. Uh, and we're not seeing a, a ton of innovation in terms of uh, new new gaming dynamics or whatnot. Um, I think the most interesting one to pop up in, I'd say, in the last year or two is uh, the proliferation of social games such as Among Us, where you know it's really about uh, playing your opponents through. I'm trying to think uh, what the word is here, but it, it's a little different from like hard mechanical skills where you're, um, you know, trying to put your reticle on the player as opposed to. Uh, playing your audience through uh, social dynamics or whatnot. So. That's more deception, which is what yeah, you're yeah. yeah, yeah. Social <laughs> dynamics, well said. It's deception. <laughs> and what's interesting to note is like some developers really support, like Blizzard, for example, they're known to be like, they're really in it for the art of the game, right? The storytelling, they really support their community. They help build that community with their BlizzCon and their events. And on the other hand, you have some other developers or publishers who are who seem to be really in it for the money like ea has gotten a lot of flag of just 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 being out there to you know push push units on the off shelves right um and depending on who the developer is they've done a really good job at building up these communities and helping these communities advance um and they're and as mentioned they've they're, they've gotten to a point where um they're not the, the only interest is not coming from the developers themselves but also outside brands who want to be a part of this kind of growth right um and just going through the like, like the like, like the rest of these uh these items here the the last one so broadcast platforms um, I'm sure everyone's familiar with Twitch YouTube gaming um, but in the early days um, you know Tyrone had mentioned that we would be using platforms like HLTV where it wasn't even web based you download a client you'd have to download the demo and kind of you know you know connect through IP and and and, and watch the feed through that platform but it was really designed for um, spectator only it wasn't really like an interactive tool and we've seen obviously twitch become this global phenomenon where uh, people are launching careers off of live streaming and uh, the the biggest i guess innovation that we've seen out of these broadcast platforms is that it creates almost this fomo environment where this digital experience almost replicates what the actual event looks like um you know with extra little bells and whistles that you wouldn't get at um you know at these at these events you have um you know different uh, mechanisms that are designed to create more more of an authentic engagement between you know the broadcaster and the audience you know brands want to be a part of that so i think the more this community evolves and the more this community grows we'll continue to see um you know advancements in technology and innovation as it relates to how that content is broadcast and how that um uh, and how these um uh, content creators are are engaging with their with their fans um, well, you know, plus, plus, Brian, if I, if I can jump in real fast, I think what, what also has changed a lot is with brands coming in, it's become much more focused on the players and less in some ways on the game. I think that was for the longest time, the game titles were like, please focus on the game. Doesn't matter in some ways who the, who these, who these players are. And now that brands have kind of begun to sponsor certain players and there are now, of course, these teams that have all these massive sponsorships, you're seeing a shift of focus now to who the personalities are, you know, and that's in some ways how the NFL, how, 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 how Major League Baseball all began to rise. It wasn't just the game. It was who's the personality behind playing it. And that's begun to shift for esports. Now you're going to begin to hear a lot more of the names, the personalities of these players. Because I think that's probably the way they realize the game is going to grow and the titles are going to grow. The audience is going to grow. And there's a human being that they can actually relate to versus just great. There's a game. I can see it. It's FPS. Good kill. 
But now that we're going to see personalities and humanity get a little bit more revealed, that's what's going to lead, we think, to the sort of skyrocketing of esports in general. That's exactly right. Anyone can stream a video game, but to create the whole package and sell it and, and have people asking for more, that's, uh, that's, that, that's the art form um, that these kind of platforms provide. And then uh, just the last last segment, um, the one where we often, you know, obviously with COVID, we didn't have to, we didn't have a ton of activity back in 2020, uh, but with vaccines going out and whatnot, and I think everybody is ready uh, to, or once everybody is ready to uh, start congregating again, you know, events was a big place where, uh, you know, we go and really bring kind of the digital realm to the physical experience. Um, we come, I think. You know, we're always working across the different DwitchCons and PAXs and uh, really creating identities for brands to really integrate and, you know, talk authentically with uh, all the gamers, uh, again, in the physical realm. So, Yeah, and well, before we jump to the next slide, I think that's an excellent, an excellent segue is all of these people used to go to these events, but now they're at home kind of, uh, you know, playing the games themselves or they're doing these online tournaments, etc., and the business and the marketing have changed in how they generate their income as well, because these events were marquee. I mean, they got more eyeballs than the Super Bowl in some ways. So how do you change that landscape? And I think what we're going to share with you on the next slide is an evolution kind of broken out into major sections of the timeline of esport and gaming as we've kind of come to know it over the last, say, 20 years, two decades. And we're going to start to layer on some of that insight. So the way that it used to work is big brands like Mercedes would come in and back up the Brinks truck, pay whatever it was just to have signage at the event. And to John's point, it's not that simple anymore. Now to have an impact in the community, you have to do right by the community. So it's not just unloading money into their bank accounts and giving them all, and they do get a lot of money, don't get me wrong, some of these talents, but it's making them better. It's giving their machine the 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 extra millisecond advantage, you know, on the road. It's making sure that the hardware that they're streaming from can support a mobile setup despite not having the right internet connection so that they can more inherently connect with their communities. And when they do that right, marketing can really serve both communities. It can serve the brand and the business as well as the community itself. So with that, I'll turn it over to the team to talk a little bit more. Awesome, thanks, Andrew. Um, so, so this slide, we just wanted to kind of, um, you know, put down a, a simple timeline broken down to three sections, like inception, maturity, and innovation of how we were tracking with the, with the gaming community as it grew, uh, where damage was formed and where we've kind of, um, helped, um, I guess, grow this community and, and, and do our work. Um, and in the early days, um, you know, I guess I'll start with just a quick little, uh, you know, little story about my background and how I got into gaming a bit more detail. Um, I, I, I mean, I, mean, I was always a gamer, like what kid didn't have like a Nintendo or, 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 or like a Sega Genesis to play on, right? But where it really got serious for me was um, I actually got kicked out of school my, my freshman year. Um, and I had a lot of time to, to obviously stay home and play video games. And um, it was really just to kill time, but I eventually started getting really good at some of these video games. Um, and, you know, fast forward to a couple of years, that's how I actually met Tyrone. We were, we were in the same high school together and we found out that we both played this game Counter-Strike. Um, I was way better than he was, so he wasn't even on my team. I was on a different team and he was on another, uh, another team. Um, and we actually played like a head-to-head -head match together and his entire, all of his teammates like was saying, that dude is cheating, that dude is cheating. And they called me out and we got to school the next day. And it, it, I mean, it was pretty funny, but, um, that's kind of when we started getting serious with the competition, more like pickup games, playing other, playing other crews. Um, and that evolved into more, um, you know, joining leagues with brackets, going to tournaments, going to regional qualifiers and playing in land centers. Um, and this hobby almost turned into a job. You know, it was difficult to balance because you just couldn't justify to first generation immigrant Asian parents that I need money. Can you give me $500 so I can go with my friends to play in a video game tournament? Like that was nonsense. I'll get you know, hitting the head with a textbook if, you know, saying things like that. But that was what it was. We used to get really good by driving around to these little tournaments um, and, and, um, and, and really understanding and learning and watching how the space grow, right? Because I remember us having to figure out now maybe, what is a sponsor situation? Like, do we need to get, how do we get Balls Energy Drink to just give us some money so we can, you know, so we can start paying for these, uh, paying for this travel and going to these events. So watching teams try to pick up sponsors, sponsors getting into the space, what works, what doesn't, and kind of saw the business side of gaming is, uh, was, 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 was all very interesting. And 
that's kind of where my my gaming career kind of stopped because um you know i i had to go earn a living doing something that <laughs> that was far less i i i i i i feel we would be remiss if we didn't say speaking to this audience of lmu students please do not follow the degenerate brian kim path of getting kicked <laughs> out of school in order Don't to play more it. video games it is not Don't the right it. way <laughs> it's it, it's it, it's fun but that's definitely isn't the right way I, I almost became a cautionary tale so please do not follow 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 my footsteps but uh um, you still have time brian you still have time <laughs> Ty, go ahead yeah yeah no i mean um i think what we wanted to showcase was yeah in the early 2000s or whatnot it really was just a glorified hobby um the roi unfortunately wasn't there but obviously in 2007 things changed completely um, Justin TV, which was actually the predecessor of Twitch TV, came out. And what's funny is, you know, it was originally for live streaming, for all of these fun different activities, but gaming uh, all of a sudden had a central hub to kind of rally around. And you see giant StarCraft tournaments happening, Team Fortress 2 tournaments happening. Uh, and, you know, gaming became kind of a force within the community. And eventually in 2011, um, Twitch TV was born. So, you know, Justin TV shedded its roots and essentially became Twitch TV and really gave gaming popularity as a whole, like just a whole new life. They pivoted and, um, you know, created an identity for it um, and essentially allowed gamers and like-minded folks to really congregate on that. And I think that's changed everything. Like Brian had mentioned earlier, you know, early days of gaming, everything was so, so fractured and decentralized. And I think what Twitch created was essentially a, a hub for everybody to really congregate. And um, again, seeing and tracking how other communities are doing. So I remember, you know, anecdotally, I played Team Fortress 2. And every time a, a StarCraft 2 tournament would go off, um, they would get 20,000 viewers. And you're like, wait, how did they get 20,000 viewers when we're averaging 5,000? This is what needs to change. And, you know, being one of the, the top teams at the time, there, you know, we were privy to a lot of uh, changes and community directions uh, to ultimately help create that title as an esport. Uh, unfortunately, TF2 uh, didn't make it there to the main uh, mainstream, but uh, luckily I came away okay. <laughs> so I guess uh, with that said, we kind of moved through. So in 2013, uh, gaming is continuing to boom. Um, and we saw, uh, you know, in terms of marketing, a big change in direction. Uh, developers now started to put a lot more resources into their esport or their gaming titles. Um, I think esports was or competitive gaming was just kind of an offshoot. Uh, but now, you know, brands were getting or developers were getting a lot more serious, uh, putting dollars behind it, and then putting in some, you know, uh, marketing incentives such as like loot crates and drops when you're watching the stream. Um, and then in 2014. Amazon happened. Amazon ended up purchasing Twitch, and I think that really pushed it to the mainstream, uh, made it a topic of conversation. Uh, and in this time frame, you know, I'm working over at uh, Leading Hardware System Integrator, and again, you know, we were able to track the boom of gaming and esports, and you know, tied to hardware sales. Uh, really, that was a key moment in time where uh, gaming kind of exploded, and you know, that continual acceleration happens all throughout. Uh, again, in that 2014 is also when uh, we worked with Robert Morris University to help set up their uh, esports arena and provide funding for uh, the varsity scholarships. So we were there, um, or I was there, you know, helping to essentially guide esports and create that infrastructure uh, pathway to the top in higher education. Uh, okay, moving through. So I guess uh, 2016, that's when we decided, hey, um, actually, you know what? I'll let Brian... <laughs> Brian does this yeah, way better. I mean, this just time, this is where like the viewership started to rival like the Stanley Cup. Um, I was in Seattle at the time, like working at a like running a startup doing uh, in the crypto and mobile gaming space. But remember, I called Todd and we we're like, "Wait, how many fucking people tuned into your tournaments? Like, this is crazy." But we haven't seen any brands like you know, like a, like a Coca Cola or Nike in in the middle. It's just all these endemic brands. So we thought, well, they have no idea how to get into this scene, but they need to because there's so many eyeballs on it. Let's start an agency or some kind of company, marketing company that does, does exactly that. That was 2016. That's when we decided to uh, form the company Damage. Um, and the idea there was to not only redefine how brands are going to approach marketing in this space, but essentially build out an entirely new vertical. Like what the hell is esports advertising? It never existed before, but now it does. Um, and because and you got a couple of guys who really understand the space, really understand the community. The idea there was to marry that with people that understood uh, the business of advertising, marketing, big brand work, big campaigns, 
and kind of create this mind meld of guys who get gaming, guys who get advertising and marketing, um, and carve out this new vertical and just be on the bleeding edge of what that looks like. Um, and that kind of gets us to, you know, where we are today. We've been fortunate to be the global agency of record for, for Intel. Uh, we've got to see a lot of cool campaigns and put a lot of cool campaigns in the market and um, a lot of exciting stuff. So just wanted to, you know, pass, you know, pass this over to Andrew and, and John to kind of walk us through, um, you know, what, what this means for us today in, the, in this landscape. Yeah, absolutely. I think that, you know, to come in as somebody new to this space almost a year ago and bring the science meeting the art of everything that I had learned in 15 years of my career, working on Coca-Cola, Starbucks, Dr. Pepper, Dollar Shave Club, and the like, and, and see a very uh, passionate, empowered, and doer stance group of people like Ty and Brian representing here was a big shift. So, you know, in advertising and marketing at the highest levels, it's often a lot of talk about theoretical ideas. And these guys uh, let the rubber meet the road because they're talking to these people, they're existing in this community, they're engaged every single day, and they're spending their free time doing it. So what John and I started to do was kind of see that there's an opportunity to, to bring over that, tech, that experience and do amazing things. And when you do that, this is the work that results. All of this is advertising and marketing, but none of it looks like it, right? At the top, you have big event signage and things like that, but that was actually bringing a strategic lens to everything that Intel was doing with their gaming and esports division, which spends a lot of money on a yearly basis. Then we had retail stuff. We were making... Um, uh, we were making videos about PC builds, which is kind of a little sub community that exists on Reddit and some other places where gamers come together and actually try to make systems designed to their specifications to whatever game they're playing or community that they're trying to reach. And these are three of the largest names in the space. And they came together to do this for Intel, managing social. The bottom left is Dr. Lupo's actual. So we at Damage actually were named and built Dr. Lupo's um, at home rig as well as this mobile gaming solution. We worked with Marvel, which is, you know, one of the biggest IPs in the entire world. And we integrated, you know, our artistic points of view from the likes of Tristan Eaton that you see there uh, on the bottom right, all in this super fragmented space, right? So we brought a lens of uh, strategic need and intent, creative firepower that John can talk about in a se second. And we started making marketing and advertising that actually served this community. And that I think is the most important part. It was all meant to serve the community. And when you do that, I can speak to some of the results of these campaigns, they were incredible. But John, do you want to talk about the creativity? Yeah, no, I mean, uh, I, I think that you're, you're you, 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 you said it nicely, Andrew, which is that I think the longest time, um, uh, almost all gaming advertising was, was, was one-way conversation. It was, it, was, uh, it was your brand saying, we want to tell you this thing, Ratchet and Clank, isn't it fun? Like, and it was just like all one-way things. And there was never a, a conversational aspect to it. It was never a reflection of the community, really. Right? It was all one-way, this is what we want you to think, swallow. And that's just what just what there's going to be. And I think what's what's changed in the last few years and something that we're uh, big advocates of is, this, no, this should be a community conversation. You should either be, either be reflecting back what the audience is currently doing or wants to be doing and or is saying, or... If you're going to involve we, the, the talking points that you have, you need to make it work with the way that I play and look at your game. Uh, I think before uh, most advertisers were trying really hard to make you believe a certain thing, this game is cool. This game has this one feature. And it's like, no, listen to your audience. They're going to tell you if the game is cool and why it's cool. And then you need to, you need to use that to help influence what your marketing is. I think to Andrew's point of view, like things like that in, in, the, in the top right video here is, 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 a, is a series that we invented called the Duck Fight Club which was these little gaming rubber ducks that were fine, but Intel was doing a really terrible job of talking to their audience, which are who are gamers who know the space and they know the history and they really wanted something more interactive than you telling them how amazing uh, their microchips are. And so we said, you should do an animated series where we basically take these little ducks and we make them face off in one-on-one -on -one fight club competitions. And we have the battle, we'll make animations where they fight and have the community decide who would, who would win between, you know, um, uh, 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 Cade Six and, and, and someone else. And, and, you, and we kept going back and forth on that. And it ended, it's like, yeah, it's an, it's an engaging conversation because gaming is an engaging activity. 
Uh, it's it's very rarely a solo thing anymore. It's the reason why battle arena games are, are by far the, 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 the biggest ones out there right now. It's the reason why online gaming is so much more important, especially with the fact that we were all sheltered and quiet for the last year and a half, is the fact that you can engage with another human being in something that you have a passion for. And so the advertising, it took it a couple of years to realize it needed to do that. So the things that we began to do with say Intel with when, with with the the uh, uh, the Dr. Lupo stuff on the bottom left was, well, we're going to make this amazing mobile streaming solution for him, but we're not just going to like spit it out. We're going to have his community respond with, what do you guys think of this? Shouldn't that be, shouldn't he do that? What if he did this? It was through using a lot of his streams, a lot of the times that he interacts with his, with his community. I think that part of the community angle, the sort of power from the people, uh, drastically changes how the advertising looks and drastically changes how people view the game. And, and any brand that doesn't listen, uh, like I believe that uh, the Overwatch League has gotten a lot of flack because they're kind of screwing it up right now. Like they're, they're not listening to their audiences, telling them this is the way you should market this league. This is the way the league should run. And if you are insular and quiet and you just believe that you have blinders on and this is the only way to do things and that you have your one message and you're going to say your talking point, um, that uh, your audience is going to walk away because they're going to say you're not, you're not listening to what I'm saying and you're not responding to me. And there's 50 other games I would rather play and be, and be interested in right now than, than you. And if it's, if it's an esports league, it's a similar thing. There's other leagues, there's other players, there's other teams. Uh, so there's such a wide variety of options now that if you're not responsive to what the fans, community, and players are and want to do, uh, then you're just going to get swept aside. And so we try to represent that with every brand and every client that we have to show that we are, you know, a little, a little bit finger on the pulse. I'm not going to swear that, you know, uh, uh, we we're 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 uh, magicians that way, but we try really hard to follow not only what our instincts are for gaming, but what we believe that the community is responding to uh, and what we think is going to happen next. For sure. Yeah. And just on that note, I'd, I'd like to mention, you know, I think one thing that, you know, purpose and authenticity of the brand is extremely crucial. Um, there's so many different missteps that happen in esports. You know, John can pretty much talk your ear off. Um, for example, I think I think one recent one that comes to mind was uh, the U.S. Army. Um, you know, they engaged Twitch and unfortunately, uh, things just kind of went south. I'm not going to go into huge amounts of detail there, but uh, pretty much. Uh, there were problems and, you know, that surfaced and there was a lot of negative sentiment towards uh, U.S. Army and their approach to gaming as a whole. Uh, and so, you know, when it comes to purpose and authenticity, that's something that we really, really uh, key in on. Um, and like John had mentioned, you know, when we had created that mobile streaming solution for Dr. Lupo, uh, the purpose behind that was not only to drive um, additional awareness for Intel laptops, but the fact that Dr. Lupo can, you know, now take vacations because as soon as he stops streaming for a day or two, he hemorrhages or he just loses a ton of subscribers. Um, and, you know, that unfortunately is directly tied to his income. So we wanted to create purposeful, authentic campaigns uh, that resonate both with uh, the influencer side as well as the audience. Yeah, thank you so much for that, Tyrone. And I do have a few questions rolling in. One thing that we did want to touch on, and uh, I'll, th I'll throw it to our uh, presentation later here is if, if we have a second, we can talk about where we think the space is going, or we can start weaving that into the questions that are queuing up uh, as we speak. All right, cool. Well, it, while we let the questions roll in, I think we can spend um, two minutes just as a, as a team talking about it's a rapidly evolving space with a ton of dynamics, a fragmented audience, businesses clamoring to get in and wanting to spend money, but making sure that they want to do it in the right way, which has evolved the actual practice of marketing and advertising and gaming and esports to where we are now. And I think in order to lead that front and be on the bleeding edge of where it's going, uh, we are realizing that it has to be digital first, which is why we call this the new digital frontier. And because this all happens over IP, it's measurable. And I think that one of the things that we're trying to do is digitize the, br bring creative expertise to the digital experience and learn from the analytics real time to make sure that we are serving that community, which gave birth to Damage Tech, which we see as something that can kind of guide the way there. And if Brian or Ty, you want to spend a minute on that, we can start answering some questions right after. Yeah, of course. So, um, you know, this piece of technology, Damage Tech, was uh, was really built to start to understand the media value for sponsors that are involved in these big broadcasts. Um, we we did a quick study for our quick work for our client Intel. They have a $100 million deal with a terminal organizer called ESL. Uh, one of their biggest properties is IM or the Intel Extreme Masters. 
um, and they were up for a renewal and, you know, our stakeholders were having a difficult time um, convincing management and finance why they needed a, need another 100 plus mil to renew that deal. Um, they just weren't seeing any quantitative numbers that would justify that kind of investment. So Damage Tech is a platform that leverages computer vision, voice recognition, chat sense of analysis to effectively understand from the audience perspective, uh, what is being seen, heard, and felt in any given broadcast, any digital broadcast. So uh, we kind of use our tools to not only surmise a media value for the client, but also understand areas of opportunity um, and, and essentially be able to get real-time feedback on how a piece of content or creative is being um, is being executed in real time on a stream. So uh, we use a lot of tools to essentially be a tech enabled agency to get real smart with our strategy, our creative and everything that we do. So there's always, there's always that component of our work as well. Yeah. And, you know, part of, part of, part of, part of, a part of the, the major reasons for that is that, you know, the, 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 the media landscape for gaming esports has drastically changed. I mean, by far the, I would say Ty and Brian, you, you guys can, you know, throw a rock at me if you want, but I'd say one of the by far most powerful media vehicles we have now are the gamers and are the influencers and are these streamers. Like used to just be, you know, you would you would throw up a Super Bowl spot or you would you would do like billboards in Times Square and that would be your marketing budget for your game and hope some people saw it. But now it's it's become so splintered that no, actually streamers and casters, the ones who are actively talking to their audience, the ones who are actively playing the game, the ones who would be most likely to 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 see it and want to play it, those are the ones that you need to talk to. It's become a much more influencer focused media purchase. Uh, and, and direction of, of speech than traditional media, uh, and, and more so than I would say than al almost any other category, because gaming, you know, is one of the, the, the foundations of where Twitch and, 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 those, uh, and those media vehicles started. Thank you, John. Great insight. Um, and as we think about kind of where the future is going, we, we actually look to LMU and the likes of collegiate programs around the country, and that's why we love getting in front of you and, and the team to kind of answer questions and talk about this because it's a rapidly ever-changing thing like we talked about. So I've got a few questions here and I'm just going to kind of throw them out for a quick 30-second answer on each one of them and uh, keep them coming, by the way. Um, so Garrett writes, hi, everyone. Thanks for coming. Uh, how would someone get involved in esports coaching? I really only play Overwatch and Apex, but would love to get involved. Is this a job a, a pro can only do? And I think this is probably a question for Tyrone because it's a little bit more complicated than just the simple answer. Yeah, I think, um, you know, esports coaching is still definitely in its infancy. Uh, there are a ton of job openings for teams, you know, whether they're analyst positions or even universities looking for uh, head esports coaches. It's still, again, in its infancy and there is no right or wrong way yet. Um, however, the advice I can give is obviously if you're interested in that, um, you know, your your level of proficiency in the game is going to be extremely important because um, really that's kind of the only authoritative piece that you have, you know, based on your previous results, you know, I have a high level understanding of the game. Um, there are definitely other ways that you can prove yourself as an analyst. Uh, for example, I know with Cloud9 specifically, um, they hired uh, specifically like Google uh, data scientists to crunch the numbers and understand, um, you know, different strategies within the game, um, just because everything is recorded manually like that. But um, I guess the piece of advice I would say is uh, continue to build those skills specifically towards being an analyst or coach, developing people. Um, for me, I come from a tennis background, so coaching kind of came naturally for me, and there aren't a lot of uh, coaching leaders just yet in the space. I think that's something that we're definitely going to be seeing in the next like five to 10 years uh, as, you know, uh, kind of the two worlds collide, sports coaching as well as esports coaching. Um, but again, sorry, the advice I would give is just volunteer your effort and time, get yourself out there, get yourself known. And there's one element of coaching I just wanted to throw in is a lot of these gamers, these pro gamers that are developed, they're very young. So their minds haven't developed yet. And winning and losing in gaming always comes down to like how strong your mind is, whether, you know, how do you react when you're like, if someone tilts you, right? And how do you recover from that? So uh, from a human perspective, it's understanding how to develop and build the minds of these young gamers so they can withstand the stress, the press and uh, pressures and stress of, uh, of gaming. So we're seeing a lot of performance, mental performance coaches coming up on the scene as well. So good question. Absolutely. Yeah, next question uh, comes in from Matt. Sometimes when people work in a category they're passionate about, it can lose some of its luster. What are the best and worst parts about working in a category that you love so much? I can definitely holler at the kind of the, the front end of this. And I think that's working with people that are passionate 
that that's an intangible thing that you just can't find when you sign up to work at another agency, another marketing firm, tech startup, what have you. Um, and when you find people that are passionate, everything else falls away. So you'd be surprised at how many times we get on the phone and people are just blown away by how much we know about gaming or esports, but they're also blown away by how informal and fun we can be. Like the dynamic between John and I is usually making fun of each other. That's how we get to each other really good. You know, so the call starts off with a little dig, then we talk business and then I bring it home by making sure I dig him. So that's what I love most. I don't know what you hate most about work, John, but I thought it might be in line with that. Well, I mean, like I mean, the, the fact that you think that you always bring it home is really the most, the sort of most amusing part of this entire meeting. Um, no, I would say that uh, uh, one of the pluses of this field is that it's not like this is, there's like a nasty secret of how the sausage is made. There's not like a seedy underbelly of the gaming industry. Like that is what it is. So. Um, the fact that we're passionate about it, the fact that we get to work in it is a blessing. Now, where it can turn wrong, what if the game you're working on sucks? <laughs> what if you don't want to deal with it? What if the publisher is kind of a bunch of jerks? Like, there's there's certain ways that you can work in the category that I think are similar to anything else. But what's been really nice about this is that the best parts are that um, if you were going to spend your day gaming anyway, now you can do it and get paid for it. Kind of nice. Uh, and then the second thing is um, it's it's been really fun to not hate what your eight to five is, your nine to five is. I mean, like I've, I've, as someone who's been in advertising for 20 years, I've worked on banks, I've worked on diapers, I've worked on military accounts and feminine hygiene products. And like so many things you're like, Jesus, I don't care about this at all, but I've got to do this thing. Whereas at least with this, uh, even, even, even it's like, it's like how um, even the worst pizza is still good pizza. Even the worst game is still a good game. It's still something that I really want to do and or focus on. So uh, I don't have many downsides to this category personally. Thank you for not, not uh, uh, just really quick, you. Andrew. Sorry, mm -hmm. sorry, Andrew, this is Nola, hello. Um, I just want to put up the QR code for the students and then you can go on and keep answering your questions. Thanks so much. Lovely, thank you so much, Nola. Um, and I, I see a few more questions coming in. Um, we're happy to stay on uh, if it runs long. But uh, one question that's interesting here and definitely timely, uh, timely is what's the current and future trend? What current and future trends are you seeing with the convergence of NFTs in gaming? And I'm sure John, uh, as well as Ty and Brian have an answer for this. But um, this is, you know, the name of the game, I think, inherently because it's a crypto based thing with a unique code that uh, makes it a valuable entity. Uh, those moments are happening daily with streamers, casters, um, people in game, et cetera, as well as the tournaments that surround the gaming experience, especially at the highest esport level. Um, so I see this as something that's going to be incredibly valuable. I think that there's a little bit of an explosion right now. So it might be jumping, you know, it might feel like it's jumping the shark, but I'd love to hear John and team's thoughts on this as well. Yeah, I think that, I think that um, this is going to be huge and, and I'm not going to, say that we haven't been pursuing this with a couple of clients recently and uh mm -hmm. the fact that the publishers own their game therefore that they own the content for it uh the fact that riot hasn't done this shit is blows my mind like like just the fact that they can own their content and, and sell here's an amazing you know ace that that other that team did here's an amazing finish by this one team uh it should be everywhere i'm i would be shocked if in two years if, if nfts don't prove to be beanie babies if this is actually a viable thing, which it should be. I'd be blown away if, it, if, if it's not everywhere because the publishers are just printing money and people get to own certain moments of sport the same way the NBA is. Uh, I, I'm, I'm surprised that the NFL hasn't jumped on this more. Uh, it'll absolutely be a thing. Yeah. And one, one thing I uh, add on to, like in terms of NFTs and whatnot, we already see the proof of concept in terms of like digital scarcity, in-game skins. So for example, Counter-Strike, you know, the Dragon Lore op, uh, AWP or whatnot, you know, that goes for $2,000 plus. Um, and obviously it's not as sophisticated in NFTs and uh, the encryption or whatnot, but, you know, the fact that these companies can create value and add value based off of digital scarcity, I think is really, really exciting. And I think we're going to see some really cool campaigns in the future when it comes to NFTs. I like crypto, so I'll fully support this message. NFTs <laughs> to the moon. Thank you for your input, Brian. Uh, also, thanking for their input, Vincent has a question. How do you think the current changes in hardware, like moving away from x86 to ARM, will affect the esports industry? 
uh, do significant hardware changes like this split the industry or bring more to the table? Man, this is a, a technical, a tough technical question. To be honest, um, our, our our main technical guy is not on, but I'll try to take a stab at this. But you know, definitely when it comes to like new op operating systems or new new platforms as a whole, uh, there's so much that goes behind it. So, for example, with ARM, um, you know, a lot of games are built for. Man, I don't, I don't, I don't want to mess this up, but you know, the Windows, the PC platform in general, and so you know, there's there there needs to be a lot more. Um, development with developers and making sure those games run across all of those different platforms. But we are seeing kind of like a bi uh, uh, bifurcation of sorts. Like we see everybody in their own respective lanes. There's obviously like the PC folks, uh, there's mobile gaming. Um, although we are seeing bridges with cross title platforms and whatnot, um, they're very much in kind of their own ecosystem right now. So I don't know if that answers the question fully, but that's probably to the best of my abilities there. The bead of sweat that was going down Ty's forehead during that entire answer. That's the, that's the highlight. You of did the well. Day. Thank you for trying to answer it without uh, the rest of the team on. Nola, we have one more question, but we also are happy to talk about uh, internships. Should we roll with it or do we need to uh, have a hard stop here at one? Um, well, a couple of our students are heading out because they do have class, but please do um, talk a bit about the internships. Um, I mm -hmm. wish we could have gone through the questions. You're happy to, we're welcome, welcome to answer the last question as well. Um, mm -hmm. But please go, go on. Okay, lovely. So uh, Ian, we got your question. Feel, feel free to reach out to us afterwards. We'll make our information available, all four of us. Uh, but let me just spend a moment talking about our internship program. So what we showed you as a diverse landscape of marketing and advertising kind of coming together with a very specific mission to serve this audience and work with our clients to bring brand and business to life. Um, so it, this is a really unique time. And like we had said at the beginning, there's not a lot of programs that offer that fully, uh, but damage being on the leading front, definitely here in LA, but almost globally um, on all things gaming and esports marketing related, we are opening up an internship program this semester or this uh, summer semester. It will be an eight week program. We will send uh, information to the team here on the call so they can disseminate it appropriately. Uh, it will focus on uh, known disciplines within advertising, account management known as brand management, where we have more of a business focus, making sure that we're sorting some side of the ROI for our clients. Creative, there will be a team uh, of art director and copywriter coming to terms with a strategy uh, intern as well. We'll be focusing on the, the research, the audience segmentation, insight, finding, etc., cetera, uh, as well as segmentation because that's a rapidly growing space here, uh, as well as a business development because as you can imagine, this is a very entrepreneurial space. People don't know how to engage. Deals don't know how to get done. So we're often doing that at the same time as we're kind of starting the relationship. And we have tons of examples of that. But what we will do is provide a write-up with those job descriptions and talk uh, and send that to the team so that anybody that's interested in learning more about an internship program uh, at Damage, we'd be happy to have you on board. And the goal there is always to, to provide a paid internship that is a segue, if possible, to a full-time entry-level position. Um, that's, of course, business dependent, but that is always the goal from the get-go. Fantastic. Thank you so much for that, Andrew. And thank mm -hmm. you, Tyrone, Brian, and John for joining us today and providing some really awesome and interesting insights about esports, gaming, and how it's changed so much. I had a series of questions too, but I'm so happy that our students and our guests had questions for you guys. So again, thank you to everyone who joined us uh, this, this early afternoon. We really appreciate your time. I know a number of you have a class as well. Thank you, gentlemen. Again, this was fantastic and absolutely intriguing. Um, we look forward to see you in our next webinar. Our finals weeks is coming up, so our students are busy. But either way, we're so happy to have you guys. And thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. And have a great afternoon. Happy Monday. Bye. Bye. Yes.